All right, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks to the organizers for making room for another Chris. Um, there are some seats in the front if someone's having a hard time finding a seat. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, a higher homotopy group for digital images is what I want to talk about. This is the paper that I'm going to talk about, which is on the archive now. I want to apologize to my co-authors. I, I didn't fill out the JMM registration thing properly, so their other names did not appear in the program, but uh, it should have. So they are uh, Greg Lupton, Oleg Musin, uh, Nick Scoville, and Jonathan Trevino. So thank you to them, and sorry I left you out of the, the listing. Um, here's a, one more little advertisement before I get started. If you go to the exhibits, check out the art exhibit. This is a quilt that my mom made. So um, my mom will be very happy if you check it out. This is the, you know, the, uh, the aperiodic monotile. So do it for my mom. Um, I would like to give you some background on digital topology. And this is digital topology in the tradition of uh, Rosenfeld and Boxer. Rosenfeld began this work in the late 70s and the, in the 80s. And then it was kind of carried on by Boxer through the 90s and, and to today, Boxer is still working in this area. Um, I, would I would sort of um, characterize this work as uh, similar but less developed than other kinds of discrete homotopy theory. That's just my own personal opinion. But um, anyway, we're going to consider what they call binary digital images, which are sort of pixel type shapes like this. The word binary meaning that each pixel is either uh, on or off. There's no gradation in the pixels. Uh, zeros and ones, right? And we want to view this as a finite subset of the integer lattice Z2. Each pixel is represented by one point in the integer lattice. But we want to view it somehow topologically. And that's the very basic idea uh, behind the beginning of this theory. All right, And Rosenfeld's basic approach is to view this thing as a graph by making each pixel into a point, And then you consider which, um, which, which vertices in your graph are next to each other is determined by where the pixels sit. And there's more than one way to do that canonically. Um, and the properties of this thing, if you're considering it as a graph, the properties are different depending on which scheme of adjacency that we choose. All right. So we're considering a finite set of points in the integer lattice. You can do this in, in any z to the n, any dimension, together with some kind of adjacency relation, which I'm going to use that little symbol for. All right. And this is a definition that Rosenfeld made. A function from one of these things to another is called digitally continuous when um, adjacent points in the domain map to adjacent points in the codomain. And, so, and since this is a reflexive adjacency relation, this is allowed in the, uh, in the target space. So what you have here is two points which are adjacent in the domain. They are either adjacent or equal in the, in the codomain. This is equivalent to the category of reflexive graphs and graph homomorphisms. They better be reflexive graphs if you want to allow for this to, uh, to happen. All right. Uh, Boxer also defined what we call digital homotopy, which is kind of what, what you think it ought to be. So it's a, it's a map like this, where this IN is the um, discrete interval of n points, or maybe n plus 1 points. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, and it's continuous separately in each variable. All right, this is using, it's continuous using the box product for that, that product operation. You might call this the box homotopy. This is how Boxer always did it. That's why it's called the box homotopy. Um, this is a, a, a weird coincidence. Uh, as far as I know, Boxer himself never refers to this as the box anything, but that's what you guys all call it. Um, eventually, other people realized, um, including Greg and Nick and their other collaborator, uh, John Opria and I, and I did some work about this. Um, we realized that the categorical product instead of the box product, you can do the same constructions and you get similar things. They're not exactly the same all the time, but you can talk about that also. Around now, you might be wondering to yourself, isn't this just the same as A theory or maybe the cross homotopy theory if you're using categorical things, um, the categorical product? And my answer would be yes, mostly. Um, I would say when we do digital topology using the box product all the time, this is like A theory. And maybe you can omit the word like. Um, this, as far as I can tell, is basically the same as A theory. Although we, we 
sort of traditionally only consider graphs, which you can get from grids. Um, and when we use the categorical product instead of the box product, this is basically like the cross homotopy theory in, in the re, uh, setting of reflexive graphs, all right? This is all new to me, though, this A theory and cross homotopy theory. I would say I first encountered them less than a year ago, though. So the, it's, it's a bit of a personal journey for me to see all of these things being worked out in, in many cases in, in much more uh, detail than, than we had worked out already. But many of the questions are different. Here's, um, there's often in digital topology a focus on the choice of adjacency. For instance, these two things here, in a lot of the literature, these would be regarded as the same digital image just viewed with two different kinds of adjacency, all right? Whereas I would, I think, in a traditional graph theory approach, you would just say these are completely different graphs and they have nothing to do with each other. But in the digital topology, it would be, um, it would be typical to view these as kind of the same thing, the same underlying object, which is being um, considered in two different ways, all right? And also, you can get a, a little fancier. In a digital uh, setting, every digital image also comes with a natural complement. Like this thing is the complement of that stuff. All right, and this is another thing that you don't do in, in abstract graph theory. A graph doesn't have a specific complement, but in this setting, the, each of these digital images carries with it a complement. And you can say a lot about this by looking at its complement. And you can say stuff about this by looking at this complement. People actually mix the adjacencies. There's a lot of work in this way. What I'm gonna tell you about for the next 15 minutes doesn't involve any of this stuff though. So it's gonna be fairly traditional graph theory approach, all right? So let's get to the paper. Um, second homotopy group for digital images. This is what I wanna talk about. And as far as the definitions of the homotopy group, this will not surprise you if you're familiar with uh, A theory or, the, or similar things in the cross homotopy theory. Uh, the paper is just about pi two, but really you can do these, these same kinds of constructions ought to work in higher, uh, higher homotopy groups. And our main goal in this paper is to prove that pi two of a sphere digital image is Z. So I'm going to try and show you the, the outline of that. The definition that we use for pi 2 is uh, maps from a finite rectangle like this into your digital image with a base point. And these are base maps so that the boundary of your rectangle here, all of those red points map to the base point in the, uh, in the digital image. All right, and we are making specific choices here. We are always going to use diagonals on the grid here, and we're always gonna use the categorical product for our homotopy. So this, I would say, more, uh, more nicely fits into the setting of the cross homotopy theory rather than A theory, all right? Um, typically, those theories, when they make the definitions, they use the entire, all of Z2 in the domain rather than this small box. They use everything and say that beyond a certain point, everything has to map to the base point. Um, these are equivalent approaches. The, the style in which Boxer did these things, Boxer did this for just pi one, the fundamental group. He always used finite length uh, intervals. Um, so we're, we're gonna continue that tradition. These uh, infinite versus finite approaches are equivalent, but since we're using finite boxes, we have to allow for this kind of operation, which we call a trivial extension, which is if you have something on a small box, that is viewed as equivalent to the same thing down here, and you just make the box bigger by adding lots of extra base points. All right, so the group that we're talking about, this pi two, is the set of all maps from, this means the rectangle of n by n dimensions, where the boundary maps to the base point, modulo the relation of what we call extension homotopy. This means you can do that extension where you just make the box bigger, and you can also do homotopies. That is the categorical homotopy. I mean the homotopy using the categorical product. All right, the group operation here is what you think it ought to be, or this is one way you could do it at least. If I have two things here which map the boundaries to the base point, we're going to add them together in this way. You just kind of stack them diagonally like that. All right, and I want to compute pi 2 of S2 in only 10 minutes. Um, the last question before we can actually get started is what is, what exactly do we mean by S2? Uh, what, is, what are we going to use for our two-sphere? This is the simplest possible sphere-like thing. People have thought about, you know, what, what are some different, like, digital models of the sphere, and there, there isn't really a standard digital model of the sphere. But we're going to use this one, this uh, octahedral thing. This is, uh, um, you know, big enough, at least in the, uh, using the categorical homotopy, this is big enough so that that equatorial four-cycle can't contract. And so this 
for our purposes, is going to count as a sphere. All right. So anyway, we're going to look at maps like this from a finite size rectangle. Uh, over here, I'm going to let the bottom be the base point. So all the points around the outside have to go to the, that point at the bottom. And just like uh, Daniel did, I'm going to look at these by coloring. I hope that you can see the colors okay. It's not too necessary. But what this means is each of these points, its color just says where that point goes to. And the rule about sort of what makes a legal uh, map in this case, it has to be dark red all around the outside. It can also have dark reds on the inside if you want to. Uh, and no color on in this grid over here, no color is adjacent to its opposite color. I, I made these colors so that opposite points here are the same. So I have black and white, I have dark blue and light blue, and I have dark red and light red. So over here, and you can, you can check if you want, no color is adjacent to its own opposite color. That's our digital continuity condition, all right? Uh, that, that same map here, I'm not going to draw it as a graph. I think it looks a little better to draw it like a, like a digital image. So these pixels here are labeled according to where they go. And remember, the rule is it has to have dark red around the outside, and on the inside, no color is adjacent to its opposite color. All right? Um, let's talk about what do our homotopies look like on a diagram like this. So our, we're using the categorical product homotopy. Um, such homotopies are known to be expressible as a sequence of what uh, Laura and Tian call the spider moves. That is a homotopy which changes only one point at a time. And here, maybe you can see by now, I have changed only this point. This white one turned into a dark blue, all right? This is a legal homotopy because it changes only one point at a time. And this one over here is still digitally continuous. I didn't violate that thing about opposite colors being next to each other, all right? That's called a spider move homotopy, and every homotopy that we do has to be done by these single point moves uh, in sequence, all right? This seems restrictive, but actually you can do a lot with just those single point moves. So, for example, we can double a column. So I'm going to start with this guy over here. First, I just extend. This is the trivial extension operation. I just added a column of all reds. But now, since I have some like extra room to work here, I'm just going to copy one by one the points from this column over one position. And you can make that, all right? This is actually four moves, but it's homotopic, all right? And what I've done here is I doubled the last column. It's not only the last column you can double. If I want to double the second to last column, I do this first, and now I can copy one at a time. Sorry, my jiggling hand. Now I can copy one at a time these points over to the right. We can duplicate, so that's what I did here, right? These guys, you can just one at a time copy them here. So you can duplicate. This is kind of like an inchworm process. You can duplicate any of the columns you want to uh, one at a time. Here, I've duplicated this second column over here. And in fact, I can go all the way and duplicate the leftmost column, all right, if you really want to, okay? If you look, what happened here is I started with this guy, and by doing these, this kind of inchworm procedure, I ended up moving the whole thing over by one position, all right? If you do this in more generality, what it means is you can translate any sort of island around in a sea of red. It can move over, and it can move back to the left. It can move up and down by doing this vertically instead of horizontally, all right? This is how you can show that the pi 2 that we're defining is a billion. Those f and the g blocks are arranged diagonally, and you can move them around like this, which is what you need to be a billion, all right? And there's one more simple trick that we can do, which is inspired by the, uh, the old paint bucket in the Photoshop. You can fill by a particular color, and what this means is, this picture is what happens when you fill it with red. That just means change everything to red, except for the ones which are not allowed to become red. All right, and you can, if you wanted to, you can do this one point at a time. So this is a valid homotopic operation. Um, in this case, the ones next to the pink are not allowed to become red, so they don't become red, but everything else becomes red. This is the fill operation, all right? So that's a fill with red. Uh, we can fill this with other colors. So here, fill with white. This means you change everything to a white except for the ones which are next to the blacks, and that's what happens here. Uh, I have to leave dark reds around the edges, all right? Here's what you get if you filled the same picture with the black and so on, all right? This is a nice, cute little operation, okay? Uh, all right, I've got five minutes left. Can we show that pi 2 of S2 is Z? Um, the simplest non-trivial map, by non-trivial I mean not homotopic to a constant, is this one, which we call T. It has a single pink point, and then sort of the other colors kind of go, go in a circle around it or something. This is what T inverse looks like. 
And it turns out it's not so hard to show. Uh, any five by five square, you can turn it into one of those or to a constant. You might ask about, what about like a, a, a slightly rotated version of this or something? You can change it by homotopy to get this or that. All right, so every five by five square can be turned into a T or a T inverse. And to show that the pi two that we're looking at is Z, we're gonna show first of all, T is a generator for this, and then also that T has infinite order. So let's talk about the infinite order first of all. This, here I just have to explain why. You can't put two T's next to each other and cancel them. They actually, they don't cancel, they, they stay, they, whatever the opposite of cancel is. Um, uh, our strategy for this is we're gonna use uh, what we call the triangle counting function, which is an oriented count of red, white, blue triangles. That is, I'm looking for points in this arrangement the white, the light blue, and the light red. If they make a triangle like this, this is called a plus one, and if they make a triangle this way, that's the other way around. This we call a minus one. And you just look at the whole picture and you count up how many plus ones are there, how many minus ones are there, and the answer, that's what the D is, all right? And it works something like a topological degree for your function, so for example, on this big picture, you can look through the whole picture and find all the plus one and minus one triangles, they're like that. And if you add, count them up and add them together, the total uh, D value, the degree here, is minus one, all right? Um, and we show in the paper that this D is well-defined, which is to say it is um, invariant under these homotopies. And this is a bit of a detailed argument, but if you have one of these triangles and you change one point at a time, um, you might destroy some triangles and create some triangles, but the, the total count will stay the same, all right? And it's also a homomorphism. This is easy to show if you add two functions together in blocks. It, you add up the number of triangles, all right? By the way, this step doesn't work if you're using the box homotopy. Um, I don't need to get into that. Anyway, since uh, the D of the T, that, that very basic one I showed you, it has degree equal to one. That means that T has, um, T has infinite order in this, uh, in this group, all right? The last ingredient is to show that T actually generates the whole group. What that means is that any big function like this one here, you have to show how somehow this can be transformed into a bunch of T's and T inverses by doing our legal moves. And this, in my opinion, I hope you don't mind me saying, is kind of a cute little trick that we did in the paper. Um, we want to somehow use our specific moves to turn this thing into a bunch of these guys, all right? And here's how it goes. Cute tricks. Um, the first trick is to do what we call subdivide the picture. This is, I'm going to duplicate every row and every column simultaneously to create this. And I'm gonna do it five times for technical reasons. You have to do this five times. Um, duplicate every row and column. This basically means every pixel over here is being exchanged for a five by five block over here. So we are duplicating every row and column five times. It's basically to spread things out so that the cute tricks will actually work. Now we're going to do some fills, all right? First, I'm gonna fill with white. If you look at this picture here, Fill with white, remember that means change everything to a white except for the ones which are next to a black and it looks like this, all right? I change everything to a white except for the ones next to a black. Next, I'm gonna fill with the light blue. This will change everything to a light blue except for the ones next to a dark blue and it looks like that now. And now, if you look closely, I don't know if you can see, but um, there are some pink ones left, but there is no pink next to another pink because these fills have washed them away, all right? And so now I'm gonna fill with red, and it's that. And this is now a bunch of T's and T inverses, all right? Here ends the cute tricks, all right? I, I think this worked out kind of nicely. Um, so, it, you know, we, we proved in the paper, this five-fold subdivision followed by those three iterated fills will always produce a sum of the T's and the T inverses, all right? So any element of pi two, can be made into a sum of the t's and the t inverses. So that makes it z. And that's all I have, thanks. We didn't discuss this in the paper, but yeah, any alternative choice of a, a different triangle would uh, yield this, I believe, the same degree. Uh, uh, but in any case, you could use that as a stand-in for our, our triangle function. Yeah, I mean, basically you're looking at, 
in in this big, you know, this this big this big thing here. If you think of this as mapping around this sphere-like thing, you're asking how many times does this wrapping around actually cover this particular triangle, which is basically the degree of a of a classical sphere map. So if you look at a different triangle, it's gonna it's gonna give you the same degree. 